Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Hallelujah. I said we're going to finish it this week. All right. Hallelujah. So we're going to finish this for last week. We got the, the, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, hallelujah. Now listen, just for people, you got people running around, all we need is love, all we need is love, all we need is love. I'm sorry, we need to speak the truth in love. And sometimes the truth isn't what you want to hear. You know, uh, people who are opposed to homosexual marriage are called hate mongers because you, you're, you're inf- interfering with what their flesh wants to do. Well, I'm interfering with it because it'll send you to hell. I don't care what your rewritten Bible says. It will send you to hell for fleshly pleasures and perversion. But anyway, that's the... So the truth in love, we have to share the truth with people. We love... And the reason we share the truth is we love. Not because, you know, I don't like the way you're living and I don't like sin. I don't like it if I sin. I don't like it if you sin. Sin's not profitable. The wages of sin is death. Doesn't mean I hate you. As a matter of fact, for me to tell you the truth is, is just for your protection and your salvation and your safety. Amen. But speaking the truth in love, what happens when we, when we have the truth spoken to us in love? We may grow up into him, that is Christ, in all things, in all things. It doesn't just, listen folks, growing up in Christ doesn't just mean you got a good love walk. That's part of it. And you should have a good love walk. But, and I'm talking about Bible love. But there's more to growing up in Christ than just loving people. All right? But may grow up, in, uh, speak the truth in love, may grow up in him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together uh, and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. Now, this word fitly joined together, actually these three words come from one Greek word, and it means to render close jointed together, to organize compactly, okay? So fit or organize. You know, God organizes the body of Christ compactly. He organizes it in a way that is efficient. Amen? According, I'm sorry, and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, hallelujah, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now, folks, how many have ever gotten cut? And the next day it was sore, red and oozy. And if you left, you know, another couple of days, you get kind of, maybe even white kind of pussy discharge coming out of that. Do you know what that is? Does anybody know what that is? That is the white corpuscles running bringing the antibodies to that place, and it's eating and, and, and just trying to destroy the foreign object of the, uh, of the bacteria and stuff from outside getting into the body. It's working at killing it. Now, it's sore, but it's doing a job. Hello? It's, it's working to stop that from infiltrating the whole body. The body brings something there to work against something trying to invade it, and it can make it sore and hurt while it's doing it. But it's, it's necessary. Left unchecked, that's the, any outside bacteria can just run rampant over your body and kill you in no time. The body begins to fight it. The body of Christ is to supply, it is to make increase, it is to edify itself in love, and sometimes that's not going to be pleasant. We've gotten this idea that the love of God is this mushy, good, we, got, we, we kind of sometimes refer to it as sloppy agape, you know, that it's all this mushy, lovey, and no matter what I do, you can't say anything because that's judgmental and non-loving, and it's, that is the furthest thing from the truth that can be. If you st- 
study your Bible a little bit better than bonehead studying, you'll find out that when the reference of judge not, lest ye be judged and so forth, is in reference to unjust judgment. You'll go on and find out. Paul wrote and said, if I judge, my judgment is just. There is just judgment. Amen. To say, you know, and to say something is sinful is not judgment. It's telling the truth in love. Yeah. And we've got, but see, the world is full of demonized, demonic-minded, sensual-minded, earthly-minded, earthly wisdom people who are going around trying to shut the, the, the body of Christ down so that nothing can be said about their sinfulness so they can live in sin. Why? Because Satan wants to take people to hell. His goal and motivation is to take as many people to hell as he can. And so if he can shut up the Christians, some, some, some town in Idaho just recently pounced, pounced, pronounced a, an ordinance that if pastors won't marry homosexuals, they're going to arrest them. Well, bring it. You can't violate my constitutional religious rights. And you're a hate monger. <sighs> Give me a break. So what happens when you show up with your dolphin? Do you want me to marry you and them too? Oh, that would never happen. Yeah, well, 40 years ago they said this would never happen. Sin gets worse and worse. Darkness gets worse and worse. Amen? Then in the last days, men will be lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. We're living it. We're, we're seeing things happen that we... You, you, we can't even fathom 30 years ago what would have happened here in this country. <coughs> Satan is at work, and he's busy at work, and he's trying to bring destruction. And we have to keep preaching the truth. If it's our last breath, we have to say what the truth is because they have to. people have to hear the truth. Whether it's homosexual marriage, whether it's uh, adultery, whether it's uh, you know, robbing banks, whether it's killing people, you know, if I go and tell you that you shouldn't rob banks, I'm not a, I'm not a hate monger or the bank robber. Right. Hello? Now, that same loony, thin, loony brain bunch will go out there and tell you that it's all right to kill babies in the womb. That if you tell me, tell me that I can't kill the baby in my womb, then you're, a, then you're a male lunatic trying to control what I do with my reproductive rights. I am telling you, the unrenewed, Demonic, liberal mind is crazy. It's just crazy. They can kill the baby in the womb, and if you say anything about it, you're, 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 you're trying to control the reproductive rights. And then if you say the homosexual marriage is wrong, then you're a hate monger. No matter what you do, unless you let them do what they want to do, that it makes their flesh happy, you're full of hate and venom. And that's furthest from the truth because love demands we share the truth. I said love demands we share the truth. All right? And the body of Christ is to have <coughs> every, every part of the body supplying to the body to edify the body, to build the body up so the body is strong. I'm telling you, church, it is time that the church actually start believing the Bible. We've got now we don't believe the Bible anymore. A good friend of mine, y'all have heard his name, but Guy Dunnick, uh, recently posted. He said, your, your doctrine and your political uh, views are expressions of your belief system. So if you align yourself with people who believe in abortion and homosexual marriage, uh, you have, you're going to have a real, real, real hard time reconciling that to tr biblical doctrine. Because you have, you have formulated a belief system. What you're saying is the politics of this world are more important than the everlasting word of God. Whether you like it or not, that's just the way it is. Well, you're a hate monger for saying, no, nope. I'm, I'm telling the truth. Well, that's your truth. Nope. It's this truth. And if you reject this as truth, I can't help you. Nobody can. You know, and, and I like to tell people this, you know, look, think of it this way. If I'm wrong, you know, and we live this life out, when you die, that's just it. You just kind of go off and nothing, nothing happens. You're just out in the cosmos or you just get absorbed in the, you know, to the ground and that's just it. Nobody will ever know I was wrong. But if I'm right and you leave this earth 
and you go to eternity and you face the God, a, a righteous God and a, and a God of just judgment who will say, my word said this and you rejected it, you will know it through eternity. Are you willing to make that gamble? That's a big gamble. Because the worst thing is, if I'm right, if I'm wrong, no, you'll never know when you take your last breath. Draw your last breath and, leave and, and die. That'll be it. You, you'll never know who was right or wrong. If I'm right, which I am, you'll know it through eternity. All right. So, but we're going <clears> to, <throat> the body of Christ is to edify itself. We're to build ourselves up. We, we have been so divided by false doctrine. And, and, and garbage coming into the church and the spirit of the world infiltrating the church. Do not think this has been a mistake where Satan has infiltrated the church. He's infiltrated in our thinking. It started with a seeker-sensitive um, uh, mantra. Let's stop preaching truth. Let's water it down. Let's make it comfortable. Let nobody feel convicted. Really? Don't have anybody repent. Jesus told the disciples, go tell them to repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Peter's first uh, sermon was repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Hello? And, and, and if you think that that little Mickey Mouse, weenie-fied definition of repent is simply to change your mind, you are sadly mistaken. It is way deeper than that. It is a change of thought. It is a change of action with actions that correspond to it. It is more than just changing your mind. Repentance is a rejection of a former, an acceptance of a newer, to have a turn in how you conduct yourself, how you live yourself, how you fo where, where your destiny is focused on, your view of things. Everything changes. You just don't have a change of mind. See, people say, well, it's, repent means to change your mind. So, you know what? Then how does godly sorrow work repentance? If it's just to change your mind. See, now godly sorrow brings you, brings you to a point of acknowledgement that the way you were viewing things is erroneous and rebellious towards God. So we, we get these, sometimes we take these little shallow definitions and build huge doctrines out of them without going deeper. Repentance has a deeper meaning than simply change your mind. That is, uh, is, is one of your concordances, you'll find it's a real shallow meaning, and they didn't do, a, didn't do hardly any explanation to it, just change your mind. Well, the, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I can, I can study behind people who are. And simply looking at something and not, you know, there's word, all kinds of words. The word agape didn't mean the God kind of love when Jesus used it. He created that deeper meaning with it when he used it. Unconditional, the God, we call it the God kind of love, the unconditional love. And you go study it out, and it's classical Greek, and it's Septuagint, and then it's, it's New Testament. And when you start studying different words out like that, when you go study how they were used in, in the classical use. How many know until about 1960 the word bad meant bad? But all of us grew up at least in, in a post-1960 culture where the, bad, where the word bad actually meant good. Or the word good used to actually mean good. Now it's used in, in sarcasm as meaning bad. Now I wonder why the Bible says, woe be him that calls good uh, evil and evil good. There's a reason for that. And so, you know, the word repent has a deeper thought and a deeper, deeper, it, it includes actions and, and, and lifestyle that are reversed from what you were doing, not simply I changed my mind. And in that, because the Bible says godly sorrow works repentance or puts it in operation, there is a sorrowfulness with rebelling against the laws of God as a believer or as an unbeliever. Sorry. These people who teach that you shouldn't ever feel guilty for sin, no, your heart will condemn you the minute you do sin. <clears throat> what do you do? You repent. Why? Because God is all worship, repentance, and worse, they're turning away from that. 
But to simply go, I don't need to repent. I'm under grace. It's, it's crazy. Well, see, that whole mindset has rushed into the church. And now the church has been infiltrated by a worldly wisdom. And remember, the wisdom of this world is for sensual, devilish, is earthly, sensual, and devilish. What's happened in the church since we got all hooked up with being cool? That we don't preach repentance, that we don't preach the truth, that we're accepting everything the Bible says don't accept is, is, is genuine and legitimate. Because that book don't really, it's not relevant to today. I'm sorry, it's an eternal book. Its relevance, it's, its relevance is eternal. Amen. I said the relevance of the Word of God is eternal. It, it is, be, be, you must be born again is just as real in 2015 as it was in A.D. 33. Amen. The truth of God's word doesn't change. But because the church began to, to, in order to get back ends in the seats. Or, now listen, that, that may be one side. One side is just to fill the church up. The other side is devilish men have gotten in positions of power in denominations and, and churches. And they're, and they're running it at the, at the behest of their master, the devil. I don't think that's not so. The great whore Babylon, Babylon will sit on the throne. There's going to be demonic forces sitting in the church. Christians are under persecution in our own country now. They cut Christians' heads off and behead them with machetes, and nobody in our country gets upset. Our president doesn't get upset. There's stuff going on in the earth. And don't think, you know, if they're not preaching the truth, and I'm talking about the, the truth of God's word, then they're not of God. And Satan, their master, is leading them. And there are men and women sitting in pulpits around our country right this minute teaching a demonic message, not anointed by the Holy Ghost, designed to entrap the minds of men and women and lead them into the path of destruction. And they will answer to God because Jesus said, woe be to anyone who causes these little ones to stumble. He didn't say they wouldn't stumble. He said the one that calls them, there's a woe be to them. I wouldn't want to meet Jesus if you're the one leading people to hell because you've rewritten the Bible for your perverse lifestyle. You will meet the master, and you will declare his lordship, and you will receive just punishment if you do not repent. Yeah, ouch. It's still the truth. Somebody's got to stand up and say something. The church has to, I mean, the church has to get its act together. The church has to stand up and say, we will not accept error and ungodliness as normal in the midst of the church. We are going to preach the truth. Why? Because if we don't, then the body won't be built up. You won't have a supply if you bring sin in. You bring sin into the midst, and it will bring judgment instead of supply. Can I get a couple of grunts? Amen. And if you're watching this by internet, I, don't, I really don't care if you get upset with me. I'm just going to tell you the truth regardless. Go ahead and get upset. I'm going to tell the truth regardless if you get upset or not. I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear to appease you. All right. Unto the edifying of itself in love. Listen to the next verse. This I say therefore and testify on the Lord that you henceforth not walk not as other Gentiles walk. Where? In the vanity of their mind. We are not to walk in the vanity of our mind. Transientness of moral depravity. Hello? We are not to walk in moral depravity. That's what that word means. Walk in the vanity of their mind. Don't walk as other Gentiles walk in the moral depravity of their mind. Hello? 
We got, we got people standing in pulpits preaching stuff that is of moral depravity. There will never be a marriage taking place in my church, in any church I'm standing in, anywhere on the planet that I'm involved in that I will, well, I will join anything other than a man and a woman together in holy matrimony. We'll pass laws. I don't care what you pass. I will not violate the law of God. Amen. I will not walk in the vanity of moral depravity of the mind of men. Hello? And damn other people to hell in the process. We're going to walk uprightly before the Lord. So Paul says here, right after he talks about edifying yourself in love, now don't, he says, I say this and I testify of it in the Lord. Not just I'm going to say it, I testify of it in the Lord. Um, I take a record before the Lord. I'm telling you this, don't walk in moral depravity of the mind. That's how Gentiles walk. Hello? Listen, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Are you here? You're going home. Amen? Because of the blindness of their heart. Actually, callousness or stupidity. Hardness. People get hard-hearted because they want to do something, and they, listen, when you start re rewriting history or biblical history or rewriting the Bible and changing definitions of words to fit your mantra of your sin and your flesh, you are callous, you are hard, you're blind. And Paul says that their understanding, the people who walk in moral depravity have their understanding darkened, the light goes out, in whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them lest they should see and believe. Satan comes to get people to believe a lie, even in a church setting. Now, some of the churches got Ichabod written over the doors. The Spirit of God's departed. And darkness and blindness has come on their mind. And what happens? They are alienated. From the life of God. Now, you think I'm not supposed to tell people that because being alienated from the life of God is the very reason we're here is to get them associated and in tune with the life of God. To break their alienation from the life of God. When I tell, them the, I tell people the truth, you call me hate. But the Bible tells me that because your understanding is darkened, you're alienated from the life of God. How? Through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness, the callousness, hardness of their heart. Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto what? Lasciviousness. My goodness. They're just, they're past feeling. Filthy. Wantonness. To, listen, have given themselves under lasciviousness to do what? To work all uncleanness with greediness. To, to work all uncleanness with what? Greediness. And it means physically, it means impurity, whether physically or morally, uncleanness. Can you hear the words he uses here? The body is to compact itself, to supply itself in love. And what? So we'll grow up into Christ in all things. Because if we don't, and if we walk as other Gentiles in the moral depravity of their mind, we will just go in and anything becomes gain. Anything becomes gain. It all becomes okay. And the churches are standing up and telling people that it's okay. And the Bible says don't walk in moral depravity like other Gentiles walk. Hello. They walk in moral depravity in their minds. Hello. 
Their understanding is darkened. They have become alienated from the life of God. What did Jesus come to do? He came to restore man to the life of God. Yet we're, 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 we're mocked, we're made, I don't really care. I really don't care what some demonized person yells at me. It's the devil working in them because they've given them, they're blinded and they're alienated. And they, can think all, and they can say all they want to say. It doesn't change the fact. You're going to go to hell if you don't change. And I'm here to tell you truth that will set you free if you'll listen. So you don't have to go to hell. My job is to give you the truth so you, don't, you, you have an opportunity not to go where you're headed. That's my job. My job is to tell you the truth so the Holy Ghost can come work on you so that you can hear the truth. So that you, because, and if you reject it, you will not be able to say, nobody ever told me. He'll say, Ed Taylor told you. And you heard it, and you mocked him and made fun of him. And it, it won't be a rejoicing over that. It'll be that you had the opportunity. You will not be able to. But because of the blindness of, the, of your heart, because of the callousness and the hardness of it, you became alienated from the life of God. Listen, it became, you, you were past feeling. I mean, can you imagine getting to the point you just don't you don't have any feeling about anything? Hello. It means you've become apathetic. Not just you know, I don't have feelings. Nothing more than feelings. Mean, no, we're not talking, we're talking about apathetic. You're apathetic about the listen. The church has accepted sin as normal and has become apathetic about it, and they are. Giving yourself because of it over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness and greediness. I'm telling you, if the church doesn't wake up, if you don't think a judgment will, some people say, I don't believe in, you're hyper judgmental. I don't believe in judgment. God doesn't judge. Oh, yes, he stinking does. Why do you think Ananias and Sapphire fell dead in the church? That wasn't judgment. Oh, yes, it was. Because Peter asked, asked um, Sapphire when she came in later, why is it that Satan has put it into your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? The same men that took your husband out are going to take you out. And she gave up the ghost and fell over dead. If you don't think that was judgment, you're just, you're smoking some funny grass, some wacky weed. You've been eating some brownies from Colorado. Hello. No, there is, and I, Lester Summerall prophesied, I was in the meeting when he did it. I was sitting in the, I was sitting in the room when he said it at Rhema Bible Church. Uh, Rooker Memorial Auditorium back then. He was there for, for a rainbow beam. He said this. He said there will be the return of the days of Ananias and Sapphire before the Lord returns. So all you pastors who think you got it cool and you're doing cool stuff and it's all right to go ahead and, you know, live in, live in sin, preach sin, accept sin. I am telling you, there is going to be a cleaning up of the house of God and it will start with leadership. It ain't going to start with Jethro on the back row. Why? Because the leadership is the one telling us okay. And Jesus said, woe be to anyone that causes the little ones to stumble. Isn't this a shouting message? But Paul wrote this. Well, he was out of time with, the, with how things were going to happen. You know, it was only until the 1820s, that it, was, it wasn't until then that homosexuality began to be accepted as normal. It's never been accepted as normal. God knew what was going to happen in the 1820s. It didn't catch him off guard that some uh, demonized Greek scholar would come along and try to rewrite the 1,800 years of biblical study to fit a mantra? Who being past feeling, who become apathetic, have given themselves over to lasciviousness, to work all uncleanliness. 
with what? Think about it. Greediness. Somewhere in all this, money is going to get involved. It always does. But you have not so learned Christ, if so be that you heard him and have been taught to him, by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the former lifestyle, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. You know, trying to live like you did before you got saved, that man is corrupt, and it's a corrupt according to deceitful lust. There are lusts in the flesh of men and women that you have to put off. Why? Because your flesh wants to sin. Your let me say it this way. Your flesh wants to fulfill its, all of its desires, and its desires are corrupt. Hello? When we started accepting, you know, well, you know, look, it's, like I said, we got, I had people tell me that they know pastors and churches, they got churches, they know the pastor has women in the church who take care of his knee, his sexual needs. They believe they're called by God to go to that church and take care of his sexual needs. No, you're not. Hello, go find you a husband, take care of his. Amen. And leave the pastor alone. And that sorry dog's out there doing it with them. I don't know where you get the idea they were sent to help you out. You're the shepherd. You're supposed to be straightening them out and telling them, get their flues and stuff back over to the husband, take care of him, leave you alone. Yeah. Yeah. Hello? That went over big. Well, I'm just a man. Yeah, you're called of God. You're anointed of God. And if you're anointed of God and called of God, you better take care of yourself and keep yourself straight. That one ever big. Send me a Mickey Mouse letter so I'll know who you are so I can send you something back. Love to have your letter. I'll send you something back. Amen. You put off the former conversation, the former way of life for the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful us, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. What? We got to think the way God thinks. We got to look at the Bible. We got to go into the word of God. We got to let our minds be renewed. We got to say it the way God says it, do it the way God says do it, live it the way God says live it, and act it the way God says act it, and stop trying to get away with being carnal and spiritual at the same time. And that's what all secret sensitive is about. Give you the opportunity to be carnal and, and, and spiritual. We really don't ever achieve spirituality because your flesh will rule and dominate if you let it. We're to put off the flesh. Where, let's see, and put on the new man. So we're to put off the old man? We're to put on the new man. And do what? Which after God is created in righteousness, and oh, people hate this next word, true holiness. We, all the preaching on grace that I hear from people, that it's okay to do this, you don't have to do that, is it? I, I fail to hear them in there that it makes you holy. I hear what you can get away with, but I don't hear it empowering you to put off the flesh and live holy. All I hear from people is I can do this, I can do that, and it doesn't matter because I'm under grace. True grace leads you to righteousness and holiness, not to sin. Why? Because God's word says put off that man of sin. Put it off. Put on the new man. And he's created in righteousness and true holiness. Amen? Wherefore, I, please help me. I've heard some of the boneheaded stuff over the past five, six years. But how can you say it doesn't matter what you do because you're under grace? When Paul comes right here and says, put away lying. That's a command. I don't care how you word it, that's a command. Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more. He did not say grace will make you not steal. He said if you stole, stop it. Yeah, right. Amen. Right. Working with his things, that with hands, that thing which is good, that he may give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth 
but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearer. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Now, wait a second here. He just told you a bunch of things to do. I said he just told you a bunch of things to do. He did not say they were automatically done for you. He told the people to put off the old man, put on the new man, and do this. Amen. See, if you read Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, you get the idea it's all done for you. You don't have to do anything. No, Paul gave us a positional truth. Now he comes back and tells us the application of that to our daily life. <clears throat> you were empowered to do this because of what Jesus did in Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, but you have to live it out. Amen. You can't, you can't use some kind of get out of jail free card and go do whatever you want to do. You made me feel so bad by telling me I can't live in sin. You're like that spoiled, rotten youngin in the aisle at food line at two years old that's kicking and screaming and knocking the stuff off the shelves because they didn't get the candy bar they wanted when they came in the store. And the mama just walking down there letting them do it. Now, first thing is the mama needs a whooping. Hello? That youngin needs his back end wore out. Why? I saw a post the other day on Facebook. It said, it had somebody spanking a child and said, we need more child control and not gun control. You wear the back end out. Of course, like that woman that did it in Baltimore. <laughs> Lord have mercy. She beat the snot out of her son. And she, she was twice as big as he was. I bet she could take him down and hurt him. Tyler Perry is going to have to do a sequel. Die of a mad black woman, too. Starring Baltimore Mama. I mean, she beat that boy all upside the head. He tried to walk away. She grabbed him by the nap and then snatched him back and started smacking him some more. Hallelujah. Because he's throwing out throwing rocks at the police. She took care of that business. <laughs> and I, I don't know. I'll bet you she got home and got him and got some more. It's kind of like that time, you know, Steve Harvey was talking about uh, this woman at the mall. He said he's standing at the mall, and there was this, there's, there's one with her child standing there. And then over there, a little ways over there on the part of the mall, there's this, this kid acting up. And the mom was, you know, trying to get him to stop doing what he was doing. And the kid just kept screaming and throwing a fit. She never did anything. All of a sudden, that woman turned around her, her, her little boy and grabbed his hand. And he said, if you ever act like that, I will kill you. <laughs> he ain't done anything. She just beating him just because in case he thinks about doing it. Hallelujah. We have to understand the application of truth has to be applied or it brings consequences if we don't. God has placed us in a, in a position to live the way he demands for us to live, but we have to live it. So let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. I, you know, Listen, if people are living in sin, we love them. We'll, we'll, we'll put our arms around them and hug them and love them and you know, tell them God does love you. But you, got to, you, that you have to change. You have to let the work of God change you. And you have to put off that old man who is corrupt according to the deceitful lust and put, be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man, which after Christ is created in righteousness and true holiness and begin to live a godly lifestyle. And if you fail, there is a provision for your failure called the mercy and grace of God, that if you'll come to the throne of grace, he will restore you. It's there. That's the wonderful. See, the truth of the gospel is not you can keep living like you're living and get away with it. The truth of the gospel is there is an empowerment to be delivered from the way you've been living. We trust that you were blessed by the word of God and the flow of the spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at 
www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.